Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Everything Cooperative, this beautiful Thursday morning. You know, we have so much to be excited about. And one of the things I'm excited about is that Jim Schulman is in studio with us this morning. Jim is a environmentally sensitive architect. He's an architect and he's a social entrepreneur and he's also a sustainability strategist. And that's a mouthful, Jim. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, Vernon, for having me here today. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. I I'm looking forward to this conversation. So let's start off, Jim, by just telling us a little bit about your background. Sure. As you've said, I'm an architect by training. I still practice, uh, registered in D.C. and Maryland. And uh, I was uh, just explaining to you earlier that I'm also an entrepreneur, having founded and and ran a uh, big box business called Community Forklift. It's a used building materials store in uh, just across the D.C. line into Prince George's County. And I uh, started that business with three employees. When we started, I drove the truck, I wrote the checks, and I ran the cash register. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, now it has uh, 50 or more employees. Uh, I'm no longer involved with that business, but I'm still very proud of that work. So I know what it is to start and grow a business. But you you took used materials? Yes. um, Recycled them, I think. Yeah, the whole idea is that so much waste in our society comes when a building is torn down. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the materials in in a traditional demolition, the buildings get crunched up and uh, become pretty, the, the, the materials become pretty useless. But if you deconstruct a building, um, take it apart, uh, usually in the reverse order in which, which was constructed, you can actually reuse sometimes up to 85 or 90 percent of the materials that went into that building, depending on the size of the building. But it's especially um, works for residential scale construction. And, and uh, so early in my uh, career as an architect, I knew that I didn't want to just sort of work for big developers and and uh, build uh, commercial buildings. I wanted to help uh, low income people, and so um, I transitioned into the world of of nonprofit work and started uh, deconstruction job training programs. So training chronically underemployed inner city residents mostly how to make money taking buildings apart. Wow. And, and, and and selling those components. Okay, where did you grow up? I grew up in a small town in northern Wisconsin called Menominee. Menominee, Wisconsin. People referred to it as me no money. <laughs> because, <laughs> me uh, no money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm a mid- Midwestern boy, but I um, moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, after architecture school in 1985, and uh, Washington is very much home now. I, I, I love Washington. I love the metro area. And I'm uh, one of the few people, I think, who are trying to bridge what they call – I'm trying to bridge the Potomac Ocean – uh, we have we have a, a metro area that is divided between the D, M, and V, the district, Maryland, Virginia, not to mention West Virginia and Delaware. Um, and uh, the, the region functions pretty much economically um, across those bridges, but certainly it doesn't governmentally. So um, – Part of what I see my work, my long-term work that will probably take uh, 300 years to accomplish well beyond when I'm gone, uh, is to try to help uh, this region um, function better uh, for everybody within it, uh, rich and poor alike. Fantastic. I like that. Now, I came here in 86, so we're, we're about the same age in D.C. 
So, Jim, you got an architecture degree. Did you work before or did you come here right out of of college? I worked a little bit in the Midwest, but my first big job was working for a small architecture firm on Capitol Hill called Architrave. And it was a, a husband and wife team who took a chance on me. They hired me just through a telephone interview. Mm. And I was actually on uh, about to board a plane to fly to New Mexico because I was fascinated as an architect by Adobe. And I wanted to learn about Adobe and I figured I'd have to go out west. And I didn't have a job out there. But I spoke to these folks in Washington and they said, cancel your flight, come on out here to Washington and work for us. And that, that brought me here to Washington, D.C. Wow. Okay. You're adventuresome too. Okay. Adobe's are are these it, uh, yeah, uh, Native Adobe. American buildings or they, they, yeah, you know? it's where you use uh, earth, uh, rammed earth, and horsehair and a lot of other natural products to make a a thick wall that that uh, that. That's traditional Adobe. What I didn't know, because I, it took me another few decades to actually visit New Mexico, I didn't learn that most of the buildings uh, in the Southwest are actually fake Adobe. Okay. okay. <laughs> They're built of so the same two-by-fours uh, in many cases and, and concrete that uh, the buildings out east are. Okay. But once upon a time, yeah. they were natural yeah. stuff. All right, so here we go. You you came to D.C. in 1985 working for this couple in architecture. So what kind of projects did you work on originally? Um, it, it was a mix of um, uh, commercial, uh, institutional, residential projects, and I, and I still work across those uh, sectors. I guess I'm a cross-sector kind of guy. But the, the, the main thing that Architrave did was a government work. And so I did a lot of work for, for instance, the Navy and some small commercial businesses and residential clients. And I wasn't very happy because I wanted um, to give back. I, I knew that uh, certainly here uh, in the Washington metro area, there are uh, struggling communities. And uh, so I, I very slowly over time got involved doing um, nonprofit work. My first toe in the water of nonprofit work was actually helping a veterans group called NACV, the National Association of Concerned Veterans. And I'm not a veteran myself, but this black veterans group uh, had, uh, had occupied uh, abandoned D.C. public housing uh, on Capitol Hill. And they, they were, they were, um, they were rehabbing it uh, without electricity and without water. They were building, uh, renovating beautiful apartments for homeless veterans. And so I got involved with that. And uh, that kind of got me on this role to work, as I may have mentioned to you. Um, Before you move on. Yeah, yeah. You got veterans that's occupied a building. Yep. And then they are renovating it. Yes. Yes. Uh, this was the, the Ellen Willen dwell- dwellings on Capitol Hill. Uh, that uh, was the first, actually the first uh, Hope 6 project after that. But before uh, before that HUD project could begin, they had to kick out the veterans. And and it was very ugly. Uh, It was basically the city, uh, instead of seeing the good work these veterans were doing, who weren't claiming to own the property, they were just occupying it while nobody else was occupying it. And uh, but uh, this was under uh, Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly, okay. Sharon, Sharon Pratt who Dixon. became Dixon. Yes. Okay. And um, and uh, I think the, the city government was very frightened of this and they did everything they could basically surrounded the whole place with cops and they arrested everybody. The veterans and I kind of left on a high note, knowing that it was possible to change a community just with 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 very little. So that was that was my first toe in the water into nonprofit work, and that led to this deconstruction work. But you said with very little, but here I th- I think you all had a lot. You had, there was passion, okay. There was uh, togetherness, people working together. Yep. Sweat. There was some knowledge, yep. some skill sets. So you you took what you had and did what you could do, and you could do a lot. Yes, it was it was definitely the power of community. Okay. All right. So that took you to where? So having uh, been involved with that effort, the National Council of Negro Women, believe it or not, this is Dorothy Heights organization. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The, the national. 
They hired this little white boy from the Midwest? Well, uh, they knew I was an architect who was interested in community revitalization. And they said they were having a, a national conference, and they said, we have this community of Ivy City uh, here in Ward 5 in Washington, D.C. that's a hard-bitten community. Uh, Jim, can you come and maybe do a workshop and see what can we do to help improve the lives of people who live in Ivy City? And I took that uh, responsibility seriously and helped put on what I thought was a pretty uh, great workshop, uh, working with community members to, to think. And I brought a lot of landscape architects and architects and, and developers to come and talk about ways to improve and enhance um, Ivy City. And after, after that conference workshop was done, uh, the community still wanted me to work with them. And Fantastic. I said, okay. So I continued to work with uh, Ivy City and Trinidad neighborhoods that are uh, mm -hmm. right beside each other there in Ward 5. And these are, um, at the time, were very, very low-income communities. They're, they've, they've since then have, you know, uh, started gentrify. to gentrify, yeah. Um, but um, that work, uh, so we conducted, uh, we got funding from uh, the President's Council for Sustainable Development. We got funding from some local banks. And I didn't really know about co-ops then. So that was that was a later part of my working career. What but year are you in now, approximately? Those, uh, we did our first uh, deconstruction job training workshop in Ivy City and Trinidad in 1999. Okay. So that gives you a sense. And that trajectory led six years later to us opening community forklift because what we, we, we trained lots of people how to, how to salvage building materials and how to make money doing that. But we, we, what we didn't have was a marketplace in the Washington metro area to be able to buy and sell, uh, used building materials. And there were uh, there were such businesses. There was a good one, a couple of them in Baltimore, actually. And there was a lot of them on the West Coast. Urban Ore was one of the first in the Berkeley area. But uh, there wasn't one in the Washington metro area. So I was on a race with with uh, I knew there were other people who kind of had this similar kind of idea. So I really wanted to get this place open. So Community Forklift, a 40,000 square foot big box retail place for receiving donated used building materials and selling them for pennies on the dollar to especially to people small contractors uh, people on fixed incomes who just couldn't afford to buy building materials from home depot got so, it you know i had that dream because i lived in detroit for nine months and my brother raised his family there and when i would say i hadn't been there in five years i go back and look at these Beautiful old homes that are boarded up and being torn down. Now, it, when when I lived there in 1965, these homes you'd almost give a left arm for. They were huge and beautiful. And mostly the middle class blacks lived in these homes. Yes. Okay. But it changed so dramatically. And I'm going, how could you take that? And then also if you take take that that material somewhere where they're building or if you had the, the wherewithal to save it to when Detroit turned around, it could be huge dollars, okay, in doing that. Yep. We're going to take our first break, Jim. We'll be right back. Please, everybody out there, don't touch that dial. We're going to come back and look at what Jim is going to do in the future and how he's using co-ops to do it. We'll be right back. Back everybody, this is Vernon Notes, and the program is Everything Cooperative. And I'm sitting here in with the studio with Jim Schumann, having a great conversation about his history as an architect coming to DC in 1985 and working with Dorothy Height. You know, that's somebody I have such admiration for. And her organization hired Jim, the National Council of Negro Women, to look at Ivy City and talk about how. The folks there could build up their community, what they could do architecturally, what kinds of things could they do. And he started this deconstruction and savage job training program, which led to community forklift in, these, in Prince George's County with 40,000 square feet, having trained people how to take a house apart. 
So most of the time we think about putting one together, starting with the foundation and then putting up the uh, that's two by four, then the frame, and then putting in the electrical and the plumbing, and then going on up and getting the roof at some point on. And he would take it apart the opposite way that it came together. And then he was able to often get 85 to 90 percent of what he took apart to be reused for people that mostly did not have money. Pennies on the dollars, what he said. So, Jim, that is phenomenal. It's You've done a lot of great work. I like it at least because I had had that idea at one point, and it was only an idea. I never could get it to happen. But you mentioned you didn't know about co-ops. So how did co-ops come into it, and what are you looking at doing with co-ops? So I first have to admit that my first personal – actually, I should say my second personal experience with co-ops – wasn't so great. My first experience was with co-ops was wonderful. When I was in uh, architecture school at the University of Minnesota, I um, I bought all my food at the local food co-op. It was a wonderful place. It it was energizing, and I knew it was someplace special. But I didn't quite understand why. I I, I didn't I didn't work there myself as a as a, a as a worker owner. I was just a consumer. Uh, so I got the benefits of that co-op. And then uh, later on, uh, when I uh, was involved with these job training, deconstruction job training programs, um, I was honored to see that eight of the ten graduates of one of my training programs, men and women, um, wanted to form their own deconstruction business. And they were counseled by uh, several people to form a cooperative And so I and others helped them to get going and even uh, found them uh, their first contract to deconstruct a house for uh, the Folger Pratt Construction Company, which is a major, huge huge, huge company. And they were renovating apartments on Wisconsin Avenue. And there was a house uh, that was kind of in the way of work they wanted to do to to extend this apartment building. And so they hired uh, the Dream Team, which was the business, the cooperative business that was formed uh, by these graduates of my job training program. And um, the, the, the sad side of it is they didn't, they didn't want too much outside advice. And we even offered a free cooperative advice for them uh, from a, an expert in Baltimore. Uh, but they wouldn't, you know, at that time, a, a long distance phone call was more expensive oh, than yeah. a local call. And so they didn't even make that phone call. Oh, yeah, okay. And um, there was also, to be fair, uh, one of the eight individuals uh, embezzled money from the organization. So even a cooperative can be ripped off. It's uh, it's harder, I think, to get away with it. But if if you're, uh, you know, running a business for the first time, it, it, you know, it's daunting. Running a small business is not for the faint of heart. So So when this small cooperative failed, I was a little bit sour on cooperatives, even though I knew I, could, I understood the power of worker ownership and, and, and worker governance. And I learned some of that during the time that I was running Community Forklift. I wasn't comfortable with the um, very um, hierarchical. hierarchical situation. I, I wanted a much more flat management, but some of my my immediate management team uh, they weren't comfortable with that at all. So and for everybody out there, hierarchical management is you've got a president, you may have a couple of vice presidents, and under them you may have directors, and then under them you may have supervisors, and this gets bigger, more and more people. You got from one to maybe three to five to ten supervisors, and then under there are the workers. Right. And the workers, you may have 50, 60, 100. But the workers normally, all information fl- flows from top down, and very rarely does information flow from bottom up, that the workers have very little say in how the organization runs, right. hierarchical. Right. And so uh, in retrospect, one of the things I learned as a small business person, as an entrepreneur, was that the paperwork you, you establish up front for how an organization and a business runs is critical to how it can function in the future. Right. And when we w- tried to go back and change some of that, there was um, tension and disagreements. In, and, and so I ultimately left that organization uh, to move on to other pastures. But while I was still working at Community Forklift, I uh, I, I went to a conference, uh, the Eastern 
conference on uh, workplace democracy, uh, which was a, a conference uh, that at, the, at that time, their annual conference was in Philadelphia at Drexel University. I just went to that conference. It was in Baltimore this year. Fantastic. So it was my first time going to the it's Eastern Regional Worker Democracy. You know, democracy, yeah. yeah. It's a part of the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Yes. That Eastern Region. Okay. And uh, I learned tons about cooperatives there and got very excited. Uh, but perhaps the best thing uh, that happened at that conference, and he didn't even remember it at the time, but I met Rodney North. Okay. Who has been on your show. Yes. Uh, who is a co-op developer. And uh, at the time, he was working for Equal Exchange. Yes. Uh, the, That's why I met him. He the was coffee there. empire. And uh, anyway, so that was worth the price of the conference alone to meet Rodney North. And uh, I, I would say 85 percent of everything I've learned about cooperatives have been from your show and from Rodney North. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah. yeah I, I, Rodney's very high on my list of people that know about co-ops, have lived it, have worked it, sweat, blood and tears in co-ops. The good side and the bad. There's good and bad in everything. Uh, and you mentioned it. But what I want to go back, um, I hope Rodney's listening. So I want to go back and talk about four types of co-ops. You mentioned two types. You mentioned a food co-op and you mentioned the, the workers co -op. worker co-op. So a co-op, the type is, is based on who owns and controls the business. So all co-ops are businesses, but who owns and controls them? So if the business is owned and controlled by the employees, those people that are working inside the business, if it's owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker co-op. And so what you get, that hierarchy that with the bottom of it is it's sort of like a triangle in a hierarchical, which is normal U.S. capitalistic businesses are, president down to the workers, it's kind of like it's flipped, and the workers are now on top in the worker cooperative. They have the say on how things are done. Yep. So it's flipped in policy making. A lot of decisions are made by the workers. And you can flip it back in hierarchy when you talked about equal exchange, okay, because you, they have a hierarchy operational uh, set up to make things happen every day, day in and day out. And when you talk about policies and how you distribute the monies and stuff, it's turned around where the workers are in control. Right. Rodney told me on this show when I first met him that he would be in a meeting in the daytime with his boss and he'd be taking direction from his boss. That's the hierarchy to get things done. Yep. And at night, he was the chair of the board. And the boss reported to the, to the board, and the boss would be taking direction from him and the board. And so that was very interesting to me because I've never heard about that before. It's extremely interesting. So that's the first type is worker co-op. Yep. And then the second type is if the business is owned and controlled by the people that uses the products or services, it's called a consumer cooperative. A food co-ops are mostly consumer co-ops. Most of them are owned and controlled by the people that buy the products. So if you were a member in that in that food co-op, then you were one of the owners. You may not have understood what that meant back then while you were in college, but the owners then elect the board of directors. The board of directors will hire the, the management. And so those consumers are the ones that have the power in setting policies and so forth. So that's the second thing. You have worker co-ops, you have the consumer co-ops, and then a lot of farmers will use something called a purchasing co-op. The farmers will get together and they create a business where they buy their feed, feed and their uh, soil, whatever they might need. And then they may form another co-op called a marketing co-op. Okay, so you got these two on uh, both ends of the farm. Also, I found out in, in D.C. there's a consumer purchasing alliance that's a purchasing co-op that is just for nonprofits, churches, uh, charter schools. And then there's marketing co-ops. In Pittsburgh, there's one of black women who are artists, and they formed a co-op so that they could sell their products. So they opened a store, a storefront. Yeah. Any individual artist couldn't afford it, but as a group, they could afford it, and, they, and they, now they can sell their products. And I bought a lot of my Christmas gifts in June at that store. Nice. Pro, the product is called Ujama, which means co-op. Uh, so cooperatives function when, as in Ujama in Pittsburgh, a group of people come together, share their 
finances, their skills, their resources, their passion that we talked about before. And they form community and they can get a lot done that they couldn't get done individually. So those are four types. You were in two of them. And we have to take our second break. <laughs> okay. And we'll be right by to look at what kind of organization Jim is creating to to build all of this his history together with this cooperative movement. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. You know, we've been around, Jim, we've been around a little bit more than six years now. When we started, we were only going to do it for one month in October, which is co-op month. And I like it so much. This is a passion that I have, speaking of passion. And it turns out that we've had people that really want to be on it, and they've enjoyed the show. So we've been on now six and a half years. So National Co-op Bank has been our sponsor ever since. And one of the things about Chuck and the group down there at National Co-op Bank is not only have they provided financial support, and that's the only place we've gotten financial support, oh, except for some of what <laughs> I've been able to put in the bridge the gap. But when you talk about this passion and building community, they've given us advice, which we, you couldn't pay for. This is this kind of help that you couldn't. They've, they've introduced us to people and talked about it and had me at their annual meeting so we could talk about it and get the word out about the program. So they've been a great partner. And their mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members. And, Jim, you talked about Ivy City and Trinidad when they were very, very low communities. And so NCB really works in low-income communities, and they provide innovative financial and related services, and they have to be innovative in in low-income communities because, as you and I know, most banks will not loan in low-income communities because they look for people that have assets, that have something so that if that loan goes bad, they can go and collect on those assets. And it makes perfect sense in the banking world, in in the capitalistic world. It makes all the sense in the world, but if you're... in a low-income community, and you don't have those assets, uh, we talk about the difference that whites have, on average, families have $150,000 worth of wealth, on average, where black families have more like $3,000 of wealth, on average. Hispanic families are a little bit higher than that, but if you are a single family head of household, you have a negative wealth. Yep. So NCB has been working in these low-income communities and helping them uh, come together. And what I heard you say earlier, and I want to move back to what you're doing and how you want to use co-ops, but I got a question before you, because you talked about a three-legged stool that architects use. Economic is one leg, social is another, and then there's this environment. And what you've also said is you're an environmental sensitive architect. So let's go to the environment for a minute and then I want to come back to the, this this co-op and how you're seeing co-ops work. So wh- what do you mean by you said environmental sensitive? Okay. Certainly the lens through which I look at this is as, as a designer, as an architect. But I think most people can understand because most people are familiar with buildings that where we get the materials to build our buildings from in, in not so long ago – you know, forests were clear cut for the wood. Uh, mountains, um, mountain tops were removed for the mining of the the metals to to build our buildings. Uh, we we bake cement using huge amounts of energy to be able to put it together with steel to make concrete. So a lot of the places that are, the materials come from to build our human settlements, which is what cities are, really wreck. The environment. They're, they're, they 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 uh, destroy forests. They destroy uh, rural communities. And uh, so, you know, when I became aware of this as uh, as the environmental movement matured, I, I, I wondered about what I could do to help. And um, I had some really good mentors. Jim, thank you for sharing this with me because I've never thought about that. I've never thought about. When I see a house go up, where do those products come from? If I see a here in the D.C. DMV, you see all of this construction. Ever since I moved here in 86, all of this construction of these 12-story either uh, residential, multifamily residential complexes or office space. It's a huge amount. And 
is destroying the environment. Okay, right. got it. It's it's unsustainable, and that's why using building materials a second, third, fourth time is really beneficial. Because, in fact, I say that reusing a two by four is actually one of the most sustainable things you can do. It's one of the greenest things you can do because you're inhibiting a new, uh, another tree from being logged in order to provide the wood. So that's, that's sort of, that's the environmental side. And as we were discussing earlier, uh, because of the way that the um, economy works, and and when I say the economy, I mean, uh, what we have for the most part now is a globalized economy. We're we're at risk. Um, the basic things that all communities need: food, shelter, clothing, education, health care, water, energy. All those basic things used to be supplied, if not at a municipal level, they were supplied at a regional level. But now, so many of those things, especially for um, communities and, and urban areas in North America, those things are supplied from a great distance. You know, talking about electricity, for uh, example? Well, well, yeah. Let me. Electricity is a great example. Our local utility, electric utility, Pepco, was bought out just a few years ago by Exelon, a Chicago conglomerate, and um, that means the decisions about our energy consumption, to a large degree, have been relocated from the District of Columbia to Chicago, and that's something that I object to. But um, because what I can see we need to do, this is a scale issue. One of the ways we can make our economy more resilient, more healthy, more, uh, more equitable is to have it at a smaller scale. And, and the regional scale is the secret um, scale. In other words, um, you, can, you can do cottage industry. You can create a little co-op that works you know, and, and makes things within a neighborhood. But you can't supply all those basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, education, health care, those kind of things. You can't supply those on a neighborhood or even a municipal level. You actually need a whole region, a uh, metropolitan region, to be able to supply those things. And we used to. We used to. Yes, there are some goods like jet airplanes and smartphones that ne- aren't necessarily going to be manufactured or produced and services provided within a region. But we need to get back to that scale because that is the more sustainable scale. And you know what that also does? Just like a cooperative, it keeps money circulating within the region. So there are more dollars spent. You know, Johnny... Uh, uh, can, who's a who's a high schooler uh, can get a a job in the summer because there are jobs available for for teenagers in an economy that is more um, more regional. <clears throat> well, when, you, when we talked about electricity, one of the things that that popped up in my head is that we have the rural electric co-ops that are consumer co-ops. We talked about they're owned by the people that uses the the electricity. <clears throat> so each house that has a meter that goes to this electric co-op, they own this business. And there's about 900 of them. And they provide electricity for 75, 80% of the land mass in the U.S. Right. So so co-ops are providing this electricity, but they are individually smaller business than a Pepco or the other electrical place from Chicago. And so it seems like that would be a great place also to work, to bring the the, the local ideas, the and I was in a conference where rural electrical co-ops, that one of the persons spoke, and they, they created solar panels, and they also are taught, teaching the high schoolers how to operate solar panels and fix solar panels. They were putting in broadband and put them into the high school and making sure that people could use them and put them in senior places. So it's a, it's a local business that, is very much involved in that particular community. Right. right. And I'd like to make uh, the urban-rural connection here because um, I mentioned having great mentors. One of them is a fellow who used to work at HUD, Housing and Urban Development, a guy named Andrew Houston. And he taught me that there is no diff- there is no real separation between urban and rural. They both depend on each other. Mm-hmm. And um, and so 
uh, the, the rural electric co-op model is a wonderful one that needs to be replicated even in urban areas. <laughs> okay. And if you live in PG County, like I did at one point, my, I paid a rural electric. It's, and in Fairfax, there's a rural electric. Now, there are urban areas now. That's true. But they used to be rural. Right. And they, there's, they're, they're, uh, electricity, electricity is provided by these um, rural electric co-ops. Okay. So now, I got a sense of this environmental piece. But you had said something to me earlier that we are only one storm away from homelessness or we're three paychecks away from homelessness what do you what do you mean particular storm part yeah even even quite wealthy people are finding themselves on a treadmill these days even without uh, a major climate disaster like a hurricane uh, or a flood or, um, that are increasing in frequency due to climate change or what I, I tend to call it climate catastrophe that we're heading into. Even even without that, even, even without those problems, if people slip up or, or uh, their business shuts down or they, they get into headbutting with their boss, they're, they they tend to be uh, only a few p- paychecks away from being able to pay their rent or their mortgage. We're all kind of in the same boat. And if you have whole communities that are struggling and suffering, certainly as we do in, in a lot of urban areas in this country, then nobody is really, is really um, uh, safe. Nobody is really... Um, Secure. This is this is kind of a uh, uh, this is security, not in the sense of fighting off enemies with armies. This is security in the sense of being able to put food on people's plates. And I believe people are coming to realize that given the globalized economy that we've been suffering under, uh, we're a very insecure nation. So if you take Katrina. Yep. And my late wife's family was from there, so I. I lived through that with her siblings. Most of them moved to St. Louis. Five of her siblings moved to St. Louis. But some of the people from New Orleans went to Dallas and Houston. And then they got... They got displaced by Harvey and and, and other superstorms, yeah. So it's, uh, You know, if you look at the history of humanity, actually, we do move along, around quite a bit. I, I think uh, there's more nomadic kind of uh, history than that people realize. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving isn't always a bad thing, but if you're, if you're moving as a refugee, it's pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so anything that we can do to help make communities more secure, more sustainable, have more money and equity, uh, I think is to the good. And that's why I started the Alliance for Regional Cooperation. So what is that? Okay. Uh, ARC is a nonprofit organization, and I'll read you its mission statement. ARC works with local businesses, consumers, and social enterprises to foster explicitly regional economic activity in the interests of economic justice, sustainability, and cultural vitality. And that's a mouthful. It's a mouthful, and we're going to break it down right after this final break, and we're going to talk about what you're doing there, where you are, and how cooperatives play in all of this yep. for this sustainability, making things work. We'll be right back. Information is power. That's why WOL makes a great partner for us. They've been a partner for six and a half years now. The National Co-op Bank sponsors this so we can give you information about co-ops. The idea, if you get this information, you will want to form your own cooperative or you want to go look for co-ops and buy from them. If you want to form your own cooperative, it may be that you'll be just like Jim Schumann here. He has an idea and he's looking for how co-ops can help satisfy that idea. Jim, you talked about what ARC, A-R-C is. You talked about his mission. Before we go into that mission statement, tell me what projects have you done looking to do? We're just really getting off the ground. Um, okay. We we incorporated, uh, although we incorporated uh, the Alliance for Regional Cooperation back in April, it's uh, a slow process, you know, uh, 
drafting articles of incorporation and bylaws and putting a board together. So we now have a board of directors. And in December, we just formed uh, an advisory board. So we're, we're kind of getting all the players together to be able to to launch. We're, we're, we don't even, our website is not even live yet, but we're very close. Uh, but what motivates this work is that we recognize that that, uh, that the short-term bottom line way of doing business, uh, certainly in this country, but for the most part in the developed world, resulted in communities that are really not sustainable or equitable. So the cost of living in our region, especially in terms of the affordability of real estate and access to capital and even access to basic goods and services that are important for daily living, it's become kind of beyond uh, the means of many people and businesses. Uh, The upshot is we need to incubate entrepreneurial efforts to enhance our regional economy and, and get some of the provision of goods and services that maybe had been provided all the way across the world. And we, want, we need to do them again right here in the Washington metro area. And so that's what ARC really wants to do. And it's first entrepreneurial project that we've decided we're going to do involves cooperatives. And we're, we're calling our project the Cooperative Alliance. And it's modeled after the very organization you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, uh, the the, uh, Community Community Purchasing Alliance, Alliance. Uh, because Community Purchasing Alliance um, uh, helps religious institutions, churches, mosques, um, uh, synagogues to be able to jointly purchase things and, and, you know, whether it's... uh, uh, snow plowing services or copier uh, services or, or roof repair or solar installations, if those nonprofit organizations and religious groups can work together to request those services, they'll get, they'll get discounts. They do. Yes. And um, that certainly has been tr- proven. Uh, the Community Purchasing Alliance is, was in the black within a very short period of time. And I think they've been around about seven years now in the Washington metro area, highly successful, and they're replicating it now in other regions. But uh, one quick thing. Yeah. They were saving churches like for trash collection, something we don't normally think about. They were paying three times as much as they're currently paying. Yeah. They just saved them all kinds of money. Yeah. Right Unfortunately, um, nonprofit organizations like uh, churches can tend to get locked into long-term contracts yep. from from rapacious companies like waste management that take advantage of these um, these organizations, community organizations is really what churches are. So to get out from under these long-term contracts, uh, a community purchasing alliance came along, and we really like their model. But but we at ARC want to do this for small businesses in general. Right, okay. So we want to create, in essence, a co-op of co-ops is our first step. We want to help all the 250-some-odd cooperatives that we've identified in the Washington metro area, whether they be um, uh, limited equity housing co-ops or food co-ops or... um, uh, you know, credit unions, which are financial co-ops. And we want to help all those different kinds of co-ops be able to help support each other, which is, as you, as you well know. Sixth right? principle. Yeah, the sixth <laughs> principle of cooperativism. So, um, so we want to use that advantage that co-ops have. And they, co-ops understand the importance of, of democracy and equity in the workplace. And we want to take that advantage that those business have, businesses have to form this co-op of co-ops. And then, once that's successful, bring in other small businesses that aren't necessarily co-ops, but could get the advantage of joining this bigger co-op. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to be able to be able to uh, get discounts on goods and services that they need to run their small businesses. So Ace Hardware is a co-op, it is a purchasing co-op. So all of these different hardware stores buy from the main cooperative, its main business, would they be a part of this? Yes, they absolutely could be. Uh, we've certainly spoken to Gina Schaefer about it. Uh, she likes the idea, and she actually put us in touch with um, CCA Global and uh, Co-ops for a Better World. 
mm-hmm. which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, a, They've all been on the show. Okay. I, call, I call Gina the cheerleader for hardware, yes. for nails and hammers. Yes. <laughs> Um, and and I I love the fact that uh, uh, Gina's uh, businesses were able to um, absorb Frager's hardware, which had suffered from a fire, and uh, uh, as she called it, I think in uh, one in her uh, uh, acceptance speech uh, or, or her press conference uh, the day that they op- reopened Frager's hardware, she said, "This is the jewel in the crown of the Washington area." Hardware Empire, mm-hmm. and it was a total honor for her to be able to buy that business. Uh, anyway, um, yes, uh, she runs her hardware businesses using the advantage of uh, purchasing, uh, uh, being a purchasing uh, cooperative, and that can, that benefits um, hardware customers here. Yeah, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't compete against um, Home Depot or Lowe's. They couldn't do, compete against these big box that have the buying power, which gets up. Uh, their products at a lower price. But now with these smaller uh, hardware stores now buying together, they buy in vo- volume, 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 and they can get lower prices right. and compete. Right. And um, uh, the, the another secret that I learned by running uh, a, a business that in part was a, a somewhat of a hardware store, I mean, we, we sold tools were, and, yeah. and, and fasteners and lots of things uh, that were salvaged or, or uh, gently used. Uh, but, uh, uh, but volume makes a difference yes. that if you get things in volume, uh, it has value. And in fact, this is one of the lessons I learned in starting a, a used building material store that anything you have in volume has value and you may not even be surprised. So broken toilets. And I learned this from being on the board of the building material reuse association, that if you have enough broken toilets, you can grind them up for road base and sell them as a, as an additive to for road construction because the ceramic that's in the toilets uh, actually makes roads last longer. Uh, but, you know, if you only have one or two broken toilets, it's not worth anything. In fact, it's a negative value. But if you have 600 broken toilets, then you've got some money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. The cooperative alliance is where you're headed. Okay. And... Why co-ops, though? That's what I haven't heard. I got this three stools and this benefit and coming together, sharing together. But why are you looking at co-ops first? Well, in order to um, rescale or retool our local economy to be, to be a more sustainable, uh, we need to have an ecosystem of of small and mid-sized businesses or even some large businesses that work together. And network them. And, and cooperatives have a leg up. They understand cooperativism between businesses, supporting other cooperatives and startup cooperatives. Uh, but they also have a sense about uh, equity and fairness. And if certainly if they're a workers co-op, they understand the importance of a fair and uh, a workplace that takes advantage of the skills and ideas of all, all the members of their business. And so... We want to take that co-op advantage and use that to get in to get into working with all all smaller businesses in the metro region. So the dream, our vision for the future, is that some huger portion of the Washington metro area economy is indigenous, and this ultimately can get down to even the goods and products that we use. So, for instance, an example I give all the time is everybody knows what bananas are, but those are grown you know, on the other side of the world or, or, or mm-hmm. at least in South America. Um, and, and very few people know what pawpaws are, which is an indigenous fruit that grows along the banks of the Potomac River. It's, it's fantastic. It tastes like a, a blend of a mango and a, and a banana. And, uh, it's, uh, it's just absolutely delicious. And why is it that here we live near this wonderful fruit and we know everything about refrigerated bananas? And not pawpaws. I love what you're doing, sir. Uh, any last minute, that last thought for people? Yeah. Um, even though our website isn't open yet, it will be uh, open very soon. Uh, we expect it to be launched sometime in February. So look for ARC, A-R-C-D-M-V dot org. ARCDMV.org. We'll be looking for it. And I would like to honor, if you have room, 
to see if I could be on your advisory board or how I can work here because I really like what you're doing and what you're wanting to do for our region and for the world. I like that idea. Everybody out there, please have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Thursday and live cooperatively. Enjoy life.